Welcome back to the Armchair Coaching Podcast. This is Coach Sheffer, your host, and we have another great guest today. But first, if you're watching this on YouTube, make sure you hit the like and subscribe buttons down below. Uh, and if you're interested in, in viewing this in a podcast form, we are available on Google Podcasts, Apple Podcasts, and Spotify. So you can find us on those platforms as well as the Anchor app. We are also available on Anchor. So let's jump into it today. We got another great guest, another Flexbone guy. So I'm really uh, excited about this. Um, so today we have Coach Alex Carrick. He is a football coach, technology enthusiast, community builder, and Flexbone evangelist. I still like that one. Uh, he currently serves as the ABACS coach at St. Ignatius, Ignatius College Prep. He started Flexbone 101, which is a YouTube channel. If you're following us from Twitter, you are probably familiar with that channel. In 2015, as a way to better learn the offense and to bring that knowledge to other coaches. In addition to football, he also coaches varsity lacrosse and won the Assistant Coach of the Year Award from the Madison Area Lacrosse Association in 2017. Good job, Coach. Uh, Coach Carrick lives in Chicago, Illinois, with his wife, Amanda, and his two dogs, Doc, Doc and Wells. Um, real quick, before we start, what kind of dogs do you have? I have two flat-coated retrievers. Awesome. We, uh, we're dog people as well. We have um, my wife's parents' dog. They are, that is a uh, half Shih Tzu, half Bichon. Uh, the dumbest <laughs> dog I've ever met in my life. It's got a lot of Shih Tzu in it. But... Um, and then we also have a uh, Labradoodle. It's one of the best dogs I've ever met. So uh, I'm definitely a dog person as well. Nice. We just moved into a new place and are uh, learning the, the joys of light hardwood floors and light countertops with black long-haired dogs. Mm. Not great. I think that's one of the reasons uh, that we were looking into the Labradoodles because they don't shed. Yeah. And so there's, there's no cleanup, which is nice. Um, but that dog, it, he's, he's too smart, but he's also a goofball at the same time. So. Yeah. Well, my, my 10, 10 month old palpy just learned how to open the door to my office. So if you hear something loud, it's probably him. <laughs> oh, all right. Well, again, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for uh, agreeing to come on. I was excited for this because I will admit I, uh, I make sure that I watch almost every video that you've posted on YouTube. Uh, your YouTube channel is one of my favorites. Um, I am a big believer in the Flexbone uh, triple option as well. Uh, we don't currently run it at our school because I don't have any say in what offense we run. But, um, you know, it's something that I, if I'm ever an offensive coordinator, I'm definitely going to be looking into heavily. Um, and so the question that I ask every coach who comes on the podcast is, I want to know about your story because every coach has a unique coaching <laughs> journey, right? Um, basically, how did you end up to where you are now? Oh, uh, so let's see. I graduated from college in 2010, uh, traveled the country, uh, working as a consultant for two and a half years. Uh, and then at the time, my girlfriend was living in Madison, Wisconsin. Um, so I up and moved with no network, no friends. Uh, and after like the f a year there, I'm like, I need to find something to do. Uh, and I played in high school, right? I'm, I went to Michigan. I'm a huge Michigan football fan. Uh, and, you know, I reached out because uh, I was looking in the area for like a youth football program to coach. I was like, yeah, like, I don't know what I'm doing. I'm 23, 24. Uh, and I reached out to like the local program, um, and I wound up meeting, uh, I mean, probably the person who's responsible for why I'm here today. Uh, his name is Brian Cavanaugh ran the youth program in Madison and, uh, well, the West side of Madison. Uh, and he had me come and meet with him because every grade level is a little bit different, you know, based on how much, uh, time you want to put in. So you know, he took me through all the different levels, like what kind of the rule changes, the differences, all of that. Um, and this was all run through the local YMCA. Um, and then at the end of our conversation, he's like, yeah, that all sounds great. Um, I'm also the head coach at the high school, uh, at the freshman level. Um, so he's like, if you want to put in a little bit more time and effort, you could do that. And I was like, I'm in because I hate little kids. So, 
once that happened, you know, I started as a, a volunteer uh, coaching the freshman B team. Uh, and then throughout that became well, like defensive coordinator, freshman head coach, uh, then moved up to varsity in year five uh, to run the special teams. Then my wife, as part of her fellowship uh, for her job, got placed in Chicago. So moved here uh, with her, let's see, that would be the last year. We made the final eight in the Wisconsin State playoffs. I moved here once I got a job. Uh, and then I was looking for a coaching position. Um, and I'm now at St. Ignatius. I actually, I was like, you know, Googling, YouTubing, like their highlight videos and my jaw drops when I see they're running Flexbone. And I was like, this is just made to be. Um, and I reached out to Matt Miller, who's my current head coach. And he's like, yeah, I absolutely know who you are. Like you're working for me now. Uh, so it was, I was very lucky, very fortunate. Um, and I've now, let's see, made it through two seasons. We would be starting year three, uh, you know, but due to COVID, our season's not starting till like February. So it's been a little bit of a journey. Yeah. <laughs> and we're, we're kind of in a similar boat here in Virginia. We officially pro start practice February 4th. And then our first game is February 22nd. So we have oh, wow. may, maybe two weeks of practice. And uh, I had a discussion with our offensive coordinator. Um, and he was saying, you know, some of the offensive linemen are also wrestlers. And they have wrestling season starts in December. And it's supposed to end. And state playoffs are supposed to be like right when we're supposed to start practice. Or, you know, the wrestling tournaments. Yeah. And he's like, oh, we might only have one of the offensive linemen for – a couple days before we play a game and I'm like so how many how many plays are we putting in <laughs> you know so four not a lot of like, time yeah <laughs> I, I th the good news is I think there's going to be a lot of people in that boat mm -hmm. yeah and luckily we're only playing we're playing a di oh I shouldn't say luckily we're lucky to be playing in the first place but we're playing a district only schedule and we've been undefeated in our district for two years in a row so hopefully you know it continues. I think we've got a good team. Um, I'm also interested in everybody's, uh, you know, like leadership and philosophy, you know, uh, can you describe your own personal leadership style? And do you uh, kind of subscribe to any of those, like, you know, coaching philosophies that we see on Twitter all the time? Coaching Twitter is one of the funniest places. Uh, I like unofficially, I've always thought like, you know, if I ever were to like write a book, you know, if I ever am successful enough or feel the need to, uh, the title and my, my coaching philosophy would be like discipline and dick jokes. Uh, from the sense of, I try to treat my kids like adults, right? The first day I'm usually like, if you act like an adult, I'm gonna treat you like an adult. If you act like a child, I'm gonna treat you like a child. Um, because they have so many influences that are just kind of droning on and adults that, you know, you know, you start sounding like the, the principal from Charlie Brown. Um, so figure, try to make them laugh, try to show like, you know, care about their school, care about their family, right. Really building the relationship so that uh, I tend not to yell at practice very much. And my players know if I start yelling, like they've really screwed something up. So I guess that's probably the big one. <laughs> yeah, I, I'm not a big yeller and screamer. And uh, when I was interviewing for the job that I'm currently at, um, he asked me like, you know, what kind of coach are you? And I was like, the first thing I'm going to tell you is I'm not going to be the one who's doing the pregame speeches. <laughs> it's not going to be me. That's not, that's not what I do. So if you want a rah-rah guy, that's definitely not me. But I can, I can be the kid, the guy who – puts their uh, arm around their shoulder and talk to the kid. And I can do that, but I'm not a big, you know, motivator personally. Um, so we'll talk about your YouTube channel here in a bit, but we like to talk college football a lot on this particular podcast. And I just wanted to know, cause I got to know a little bit about you. Well, who are your favorite college teams, whether or not they're option, uh, who do you like to watch and who do you root for? So first and foremost, like 
my degree is from Michigan. Uh, I am an avid Michigan football fan. And uh, I actually grew up a Notre Dame fan because my mom went there, which growing up in the state of Michigan, uh, I thought this was normal. And the more I've talked to people, it's not. But like we have two Big Ten schools, big rivalry. So starting from like kindergarten, you know, Michigan, Michigan State week was a big deal. And like you would be lining up at recess and there'd be like the Michigan line, the Michigan State line. And depending on who was going like, oh, the Michigan line's obviously going first. So as a Notre Dame fan, I was always like, I'm kind of the idiot in the middle. Uh, and then throughout high school was a big Notre Dame fan. So got made fun of for that. And then wound up going to Michigan because it was in state. And I didn't get into Notre Dame. But I got the nice acceptance letter because my mom went there. Or the nice decline letter because my mom went there. Uh, <laughs> not that I'm still bitter, but I think it all worked out. Uh, as far as other football teams, um, obviously rooting against Ohio State and everything. Um, due to the Flexbone stuff, uh, I don't follow or root for Georgia Tech as much anymore. Um, but obviously when I was doing the videos, I did because it made the videos more interesting to do. Um, service academies because of the option and you can't root against the military. Uh, there are coaches individually that I really like um, to go complete polar opposite of like option football. Like Mike Leach is one of my favorite coaches. I think that's everyone. Um, I've never been this excited for the Egg Bowl. Like Lane Kiffin against uh, Mike Leach should be good. Uh, God, who am I forgetting? I'm sure there's others out there, but those are always my like, and especially when it comes to like coaching Twitter, Mike Leach is always the, uh, has some good quotes. Yeah, we uh, it, somehow, it, it, when we, a lot of the uh, other podcasts that we do on here is um, we do some program profiles where we go through and we talk about the different programs. Like we've talked about Clemson, Bama, Ohio State. Haven't gotten to Michigan yet. Uh, we will. But, um, you know, somehow Mike Leach comes up in every single podcast <laughs> somehow. I don't know how it happens, but he must be one of our fav all-time favorites. So, And you kind of mentioned Georgia Tech. I know this wasn't on the uh, question list, but um, how do you feel about what happened to Paul Johnson? I, I feel bad, like at, as an option coach, right? You're always kind of battling the stigma. You know, people see the the Mike Leach offense, right? They they want to throw the ball around, you know, parents, administration, whatever it is. Um, but then you realize like not everyone has a five-star quarterback. Like sometimes you're lucky if you have two offensive linemen that can pass block. Like it, it and especially obviously coaching in the Midwest, like, by the end of the season, it's cold. So like very cold. So uh, it's always just been something with the offense that I've enjoyed. And I can tell that Paul Johnson, you know, he, he was there and with all the institutional stuff, as far as budget, as far as uh, admission standards, it wears on you. Um, and when you're at the point where you're, you know, you've accomplished everything you want to accomplish and you've made enough dollars to be comfortable like if you just kind of want to ride off into the sunset like more power to you yeah i uh, i was kind of ticked off because the way i saw it there were rumors that the boosters were trying to force him out i don't know if that's true um you know there's always going to be rumors right? right i know the fans didn't like him because they were tired of the triple option even though if you look at his winning percentage he's brought he brought unprecedented winning to that team with the type of talent that they get. Um, and, you know, I, I will admit there have been a couple times where I may have posted your um, the Citadel versus Georgia tech game a couple times on Twitter. <laughs> and I said, I might still be a little salty about this, but um, you know, cause I feel bad now. I feel bad that I was making fun of them uh, because I actually like their new coach as like a culture guy, I yeah. like him. I'm still a little ticked off about, you know, I saw what they did in their spring game as a little bit of disrespect. I know some people say, see it the other way around. Um, but I don't know if that was him or if that was like the offensive staff or what was going on there. But and, cause now that I'm like, I'm not going to say I'm old 
but I'm a little wiser in my coaching years. Uh, I, I don't want to see anybody fail. You know, does that make sense? Like it, it, it makes total sense. You know, because like I, res- I, I respect people more because I, they're in this profession and we're all in this profession together. And I, I feel bad for making fun of the guy, but I still do it every once in a while. And I shouldn't. <laughs> but yeah, as, as far as the spring game stuff, you're like, if you're trying to like change the culture, get people excited, right? Like, is it a little bit of a pot shot? Yes. But the net is probably going to be positive, right? Like, mm-hmm. Paul Johnson built a great program that he was able to take over. It's not like, you know, taking over a unsuccessful school. So yeah, it is what it is. Um, so he was the last power five coach to run the triple option. And there haven't been any power five schools other than Georgia tech that I know of that have recently run an option based offense. Do you think athletic directors in the power five are afraid of hiring an option coach? So like, what would it take for another power five school to hire somebody like Paul Johnson or uh, Ken Niamatololo or, um, you know, anybody else? So what was it? It was two or three years ago when Arizona was going to hire someone that there was rumors that Ken Niamat, I was going to butcher that name. Uh, I just that was, Coach Ken. Yeah, Coach Ken gonna, was going to take over Arizona, and I think it was uh, Tate. Uh, I almost said Tate Martell. That's not right. Um, shoot, who's their quarterback? I know his last name was Tate. I can't remember his first name. Oh, that's right, because I'm thinking <laughs> Tate is a first name. Anyway, uh, and he, like, threatened to transfer. I, I think there, if you're going to do it, you need to, like, sell out and own it. Mm-hmm. Uh I think it's, it would take a program that, you know, Clemson's not going to turn around and hire an option coach. Um, any of your traditional blue, bu- blue blood programs or, you know, if, if you're constantly winning, you're not going to make that shift. Uh, but it's going to take someone that has the, you know, courage, foresight. You know, Georgia Tech's a good example. If you don't have the resources, you don't have the facilities, you're not going to, you know, recruit head to head against Georgia uh in their instance someone that can do more with less uh mm-hmm. so anyone that is people ask me this question a fair amount you know i look at like a a kansas i look at a nebraska i look at yeah you know, rutgers always kind of gets made fun of but uh oregon state any team and then of course any g5 team right just you could make that jump but it, you would need a fan base that i think is I don't know, forgiving enough, uh, willing to change, willing to put the resources, willing to know that it's not going to happen overnight. Um, but they might sneak a few wins that they probably shouldn't get. So I, I don't think it's, I don't think it's, uh, I don't think it will never happen. Mm -hmm. I think that's a double negative, but it'll happen again. I think someone will make that chance, whether it's taking coach Ken or, uh, Jeff Monken from army. Um, or I think there's the, the tree is, I think still pretty wide of even like G five or, or FCS guys coming up. I don't personally see coach Munkin leave an army unless it was for a power five school, unless it was like a, an upper level. Yeah. I think he feels pretty confident where he's at now and he should, because it's kind of like uh, coach Ken. I see him as like the perfect fit for Navy and I see coach Munkin as the perfect fit for army. Um, and so something massive, like maybe a Vanderbilt, it would have to be a bigger that's, school, that's like a, a Vanderbilt. Um, or I could see where the fan base of a group of five school would kind of get behind it. If they see the success that army has had, maybe not so much last season. Um, <laughs> but you know, the, the two seasons before then, and right now they're two and O beating up on people. So I think somebody would be willing to look into it, but who's it going to be, right? And I, looking similar to Georgia Tech, like I would put someone like Northwestern maybe in that group, um, Stanford in that group. So, yeah, I, I think it's out there. It'll, it'll happen. I don't know when. Hopefully soon. Yeah, hopefully. Then, then you'll have more content for your uh, YouTube channel, right? Yeah, yeah, more things for people to ask me to cut up. <laughs> um, so 
you do run the YouTube channel Flexbone 101. It is one of uh, it's one of my top YouTube channels, the ones that I watch a lot. Uh, and could you tell the listeners the story behind that, how you got that started? Yeah, I so when so I started coaching at West. My second year, we brought in a new offensive coordinator who ran uh, kind of a bastardized flex bone. But he, he liked to control it, so there wasn't as much actual reading and optioning. Uh, but once we started learning and I was like drawing it out and lear- you know, the, the old adage of like, if you can't block them, read them. And being like, hey, we don't have the biggest linemen. We don't have all the talent. Um, and he had previously won a state title. So it was, uh, I got really excited because it was something that I wasn't super familiar with. And I was a young coach and dumb and just wanted to learn in general. So I just kind of, I was like, well, who runs it? All right, Georgia Tech runs it. I was like, okay, well, what's the best way to figure it out? Like, all right, well, I'm going to cut up all the offensive plays and I'm going to try to label them as if it were like my own little quiz. And I was like, well, maybe other people would want this because there's nothing else like it. Uh, you know, at that time I was on YouTube, you know, I'm trying to learn off like old blog posts and like coach Huey posts from years before and like putting together a bunch of stuff. Um, and so once that happened, I was like, well, I can, I can, I felt confident enough to label the plays and the formations. And I was like, well, there's not enough, you know, as far as like original content, I was like, well, maybe I should just put down like some basics. And it just kind of grew from there on, you know, doing cutups, which now that, like it was one year I tried to do stats with it and do like stat insights. And I was like, that's so much work. And I don't, I don't have the bandwidth to do it on top of coaching at the same time. So I'd wind up like six weeks behind. I was like, that's not going to work. And uh, then just, well, because of COVID, <clears throat> when we weren't coaching, um, I realized that I had nothing to do and I wasn't leaving the house. And so I tried like joining other places or like other organizations and there was nothing quite the same. And I was like, wait, I already have this YouTube channel and this like following sounds so pretentious. I don't really want to say that. Like I've already kind of built this thing. Um, let, what, what else can I do with it? Mm-hmm. Um, so I started just recently started like streaming and playing around with all the technology around that. And you know, I was like, Hey, I can take that time that I'm cutting up film and just stream and like answer questions and hang out. Um, cause otherwise it's just kind of lonely or I'm listening to music. So it's been interesting, uh, to say the least, especially in the off season. It's kind of how I keep my skills sharp when I can just break down games. So I, I can still stay close to the game, see things, you know, you're like, Oh, I'm going to take down this wrinkle. Cause I haven't seen that before. Yeah. Um, I was just recent. I actually recently watched your latest stream. Um, and so that was pretty interesting insight into how that was going on. Um, what, what, uh, what software were you using for that? Uh, for the actual streaming? Yeah. Uh, I use Streamlabs OBS. Okay. Um, and then I think OBS is the open source one. That's like the standard I don't think I have enough following to start doing streams or the knowledge to do any of that kind of stuff. So it's sort of like football. There's its own little like community around it and you can start super basic, uh, you know, especially since like every laptop has a camera on it, but it gets very, you realize you're starting to like produce your own TV show kind of thing. And then streaming you're like wait i'm the producer and i'm talking and i have to actually pay attention to like the film i'm breaking down so i can definitely see where people get really uh scatterbrained while they're doing it yeah definitely i um recently had i told my wife because i'm trying to you know schedule people to come on the podcast what days work best for what coaches like that all the times and i told her i was like man i i need a secretary for all of this (laughs) and she's like i ain't doing it (laughs) so I, 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 sch- goes. I scheduled a call with some guy who had a link in his email signature and it literally just like had his availability and you like signed up for a spot. And I was like, Oh, oh wow. I might keep that in mind. You don't happen to remember uh, what website it was. Do you? Uh, I'll, I'll take a look and get back yeah. to you. I don't have it off the top of my head. Um, talk a little bit about the option 
what are some of your favorite plays and concepts within the option offense? Like you can obviously say, I like everything about the offense, but everyone has like a favorite play. What would you think it, yours is? Man, I, that's a, it's like choosing your favorite children. Mm-hmm. Like no one's asked me this. It's like, shit. <laughs> I think mid, you know, I'm going to go mid triple because okay. I think it, it really brings together triple and midline together. Um, it's quick hitting. It gets the ball out on the perimeter. Um, and especially we face a lot of teams with big uh, defensive linemen. So the less we have to block them, the better. Makes sense. I'm a, my background is wing T, but okay. I still love the triple option. And so I know it's kind of a cop-out answer, but I love belly. That's one of my favorite plays. Uh, the belly G, you know, with the pulling guard, it's one of my favorite plays of all time. It's super simple. Down, down, pull, kick out. You got your full back up the middle. There you go. Um, I also like midline, too, because uh, I run I run triple option on uh, NCAA 14. I still play it. I, I've almost burned out my, D, my disc because I play it too much. But um, – when I when I'm doing a dynasty, I run the triple. I run the the navy offense, and I just run midline, 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 and all, from every formation you possibly can, just run midline. Probably run it about thirty times a game, but my quarterback gets about two hundred yards rushing. I I remember the early NCAA games. Uh, you know, they, like every team would have an option play, and I remember mm-hmm. speed option was always just like get tackled instantly, and. At that point, this was pre like me coaching. This is me in like, yeah, shithead in high school. Uh, and you're just like, wait, I just like choose? Like, I didn't realize you're actually supposed to read it. So I would mm-hmm. just like guess. And you're like, all right, well, fine. <laughs> yeah, I was always, uh, I was always mad at the, the um, actual game makers because the army offense is horrible on the game. It's just, they, the wing T concepts they have on there, like trap trap never works. No. You always get tackled. They, they, they never fall for it. They don't have buck sweep. They don't have, you know, the rocket toss play sucks. Cause the, the defense always tackles you in the backfield. It's some of those plays are trash, but I think I found uh, one of my other fav- favorite things to do. I like to see how the defense aligns to over, you know, my favorite. I like to see how they align to over. And if they overshift, I run triple the other way or um, fullback option the other way. And so it, that gets me 20 yards every time if they overshift. All right. Maybe I'm talking a little bit too much video games. <laughs> um, so back to some real football, though. You know, we, we don't always have a dual threat quarterback or a running quarterback or, you know, we're going to have different types of A backs and B backs and, Sometimes you'll have good receivers. Sometimes you don't. Uh, what are some ways that you would adapt the offense for players of different skill sets? So maybe an example would be how would you adapt it for a running quarterback versus how would you adapt it for a guy who's really good at passing? So we just recently had a quarterback who graduated who was uh, more of a passer. Um, so we definitely – to play to his strengths, uh, emphasize play action pass. We're like, all right, we know like we have to get these concepts down um, and like run these plays to give the defense the look to allow us to play action pass. Uh, And you know, you wind up throwing these wide open passes because A, no one's really expecting it. And B, if you're actually running with any success, they're like selling out for the run. Um, Matt Miller, my current head coach actually played quarterback in this offense uh in college so he's uh very much of thinking through you know i would argue we probably practice passing too much compared to like how much we probably should uh but giving him a chance um and knowing that you know he's not going to break off the you know tobias oliver like 60 yard run Um, but really managing, almost putting them on a pitch count um, and knowing like, hey, I don't need you to get 60. I need you to get like four and like don't take a big hit doing it. 
because uh, especially, you know, a bigger, slower kid tends to, you know, get banged up uh, not only through a game, but throughout a season. Um, and then when you have to manage a backup quarterback and who's starting, who's coming in, who's coming out um, at one point, I don't know how smart it was, but we were kind of rotating quarterbacks. Like if it was third and long our throwing quarterback was going in. Uh, but if it was first and 10, we might stick with our running quarterback and try not to give it away too much. Do you guys ever go into any gun sets or are you staying strictly under center? We stay strictly under center. Um, and there, there was a point, so our, our wide receivers, I don't really, um, not to disparage them, they're great young men. They were not the most talented. Uh, so at one point I advocated, I was like, just put our backup linemen, like people that can block out there because uh, they still have to cover them, but at least we know we're going to get blocking on the edge. Um, we didn't do that, but it's one of those things where you don't need incredible athletes. Uh, if you have a quarterback that can make a read and a be back with a little bit of force, like you can still be pretty dangerous. For your be backs, are you looking more for like the beefy, like the normal fullback type? Or are you going to look for like the best type of running back you can find? Ideally, we want our not necessarily the true traditional fullback. Um, we haven't had we have we've had one kid like that, but he was also the best running back on the team. So I would imagine, and we actually we play Juliet Catholic, which is where Mike Allstott went to school. So like very much a Mike Allstott, like mm -hmm. he was the man um, to be able to carry the ball twenty times a game up the middle and not slow down but also could you know break 40 50 yards um, if you needed him to so selling this offense can be a little difficult you know um, I think in college I the triple option out of all of the other what I would call dinosaur offenses I I recently had a uh, coach uh, Kevin Swift on and so he's the big dinosaur offense guy um, any of those dinosaur offenses, I think the triple option is probably the one that's the most accepted. Most like that, if you understand what I'm saying, mm -hmm. um, you know, it's more acceptable to run a triple option than it is maybe a single wing or a, or a wing T in some areas. Um, how do you sell this offense uh, to a couple different people? How do you sell it to the players? How do you sell it to the parents who might be the worst? And how do you sell it to just the community in general? Uh, we're very fortunate with our parents. Uh, people hear what school I coach at and they'll often be like, oh man, the parents must be terrible. And I'm like, no, our parents are actually great. Uh, they're very hands off. They really just want the best for their sons and the best for the school. And they trust us. or someone recently uh, or one of the other teams in our conference and talked about like, Oh, do you think like we'll ever go to that? Like spread, you know, shotgun four wide receivers. Look like, you know, we should really look into that. <laughs> and Matt, my head coach just looks over. He's like, no, <laughs> like not going to happen. <laughs> uh, oh, because they were talking about uh, JJ McCarthy who was playing in our conference, who now goes to IMG who will be a Michigan quarterback hopefully, uh, here soon. So when you selling the offense, we really sell to our guys, like the first practice, you know, we kind of go over the history, we go over where it comes from and we really sell that it's the ultimate team offense. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, no one is going to be the star, right. And it really requires all 11 guys to buy in, you know, and not care about the credit, uh, because, you know, triple option three guys might be getting the ball as a coach you don't really control that uh, but really it really is our 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 theory our plan to bring the offense together that you really have to be selfless in this offense um, and coaching at a, a catholic school kind of having those those values underlying on you know, sacrifice and teamwork and knowing that if everyone does their job, we're going to be successful. 
And for the most part, our guys have bought in. And quite frankly, we, it's not like we have a bunch of D1 athletes walking through the door. So it gives us the best opportunity to compete week in and week out. I wonder if that's probably the reason why the option works so well at a military school, because that's what they're, what's, that's, what's being drilled into their head anyways, you know, life and death, death situations. You're, you're relying on your team. You're not, it's not an individual effort. It's all about the team, right? It's all about your brothers who are standing beside you. And it's almost like the, I shouldn't say they don't have to work at it, but it's almost like the coaches don't have to teach this. You know, I feel like at a high school, you kind of have to teach it and be like, look, you got to play together. But at a military academy, it's like, yep, we already know that we're already bought in. So yeah. as coaching a backs, I think it, it's interesting, right? Cause you know, whether you run triple after triple, right. You know, you want to block really hard when your uh, counterpart is running the ball because you want him to block really hard when you run the ball. Um, and it, it, it's very much, you know, there's a little bit of, of swag on our team, at least in our position group around that. Like they very much want to play for each other because they also know it's going to benefit them in the long run. It's one of those offenses that I say, I keep telling everybody, it's a, it's a culture building offense. If you're looking to build a culture like that, um, the offense will inherently help out with that process. Um, you know, but there's a lot of teams out there who run triple option and they aren't very good at it. Right. So maybe, maybe they don't have the right culture for it, or maybe their coaches aren't coaching it the right way. I don't know. I, I can't, you know, every offense has won a championship somewhere and every offense has su stunk somewhere else. You know what I mean? Uh, but, but there's something to be said if also, if you have like a strong feeder program, right? Like you can get the guys bought in early and then you're not, um, you know, kind of reprogramming players. Uh, there's definitely a difference where, you know, in a youth team, if, if it's not affiliated, where you might have a kid that was an all-star receiver and you're like, well, you're an A-back now. And like being able to A, have that conversation, get the kid to buy in. Um, or on the flip side, sometimes you're like, hey, I play tight end. And you're like, you need to find another position. Uh, because we don't really use one and, or if we do, it's usually like our big wide receiver that comes down. So getting kids, like you said, to buy in, understand what's happening. And it's not that you don't value those things. It's where does it fit within the offense? Yeah, definitely. All right. Um, last question. What would you tell a parent or player who is convinced they can't get recruited if they're playing on an option team? Um, I've dealt with this before. I, oh, I'm, I, I think every option coach probably has, uh, at the end of the day, if you have talent, you're going to get recruited. Um, in this offense, if, if you are a D one kid or you have mm -hmm. aspirations, right. To play at the higher level. Like if you're a lineman, great. Like we're running the ball. You're going to showcase your run blocking. If you're a skill player, uh, you know, if you're, very, very high level. You're probably the quarterback or the B back, and you're going to be touching the ball 30 plays a game um, and getting a lot of great film. Uh, and at the end of the day, a lot of college coaches, they're looking for um, potential, right? So they want to know, are you a good student? Are you going to get the grades? Are you going to be in the weight room? Do they need to worry about you, you know, Friday, Saturday night? coaches are much more prone to take a kid that is going to be a program kid and they're not going to have to worry about than taking the all-star athlete with all the stats that might be a head case and doesn't work out. Um, Cause I think those are the conversations you tend to have with college coaches when they come around. Yeah. Um, so some final thoughts, we've talked a lot today. Um, but, you know, there's a lot of coaches out there um, like myself who aren't even coaching. I, and I think you mentioned it. You don't have a, a, any football until February, right? True. Yeah. So there's a lot of us who aren't coaching right now, um, dealing with a lot of problems that we're not used to, right? So uh, what are some final words of wisdom that you would have for those coaches out there? So 
I, I had a, like this, this has been a big thing for me um, because without coaching, right. That's usually, you know, 20, 30, 40 hours a week. Um, that's just gone. And there's that camaraderie amongst the coaching staff. There's the camaraderie with your players. Um, and honestly, that was really hard for me. Um, I drove my wife nuts uh, because I was like a lost puppy and I just like got depressed and it was bad. Um, and it's recognizing, and especially for players, I have no idea what it's like to be a high school boy or any younger football player um, in the times of COVID. But as like an advocate of, you know, mental health is really important and, you know, it's okay to not be okay um, and to ask for help. Like, I, I don't think I learned to really ask for help and not feel bad about it until like college. And that was mainly just because like I needed help academically uh, for certain things. And especially um, I had, so not to be a, downer for like two seconds, but, uh, a, a former player of mine, um, passed away during COVID. Um, and I had to attend his funeral via zoom. Um, and he would be starting his senior year this year. Um, and, and it had to do with, with COVID with that, um, you know, anxiety, depression, addiction. Um, so I think for, for coaches, for players, well, for coaches insanely, right? Like reach out to your players, right? Make them aware that you're there for them. Um, you know, phone, text, you know, however many ways we keep in contact with our players. Um, but really reaching out, um, cause especially high school boys aren't forthcoming, um, <laughs> with issues. Um, but just knowing that you're there, right? If, if there's struggles, if there's struggles at home, let them know that you're there. Um, and especially if any high school, college, right. Students are, are listening now or in the future, um, ask for help, ask your coaches. We've all been there. Um, we're all kind of, it's the high school musical. Like we're all in this together kind of thing. And, uh, it's, we'll, we'll get through it eventually. And, uh, just because we're not on the field doesn't mean we stop being coaches. Yeah. That makes a lot of sense coach i appreciate you uh saying all that now we're gonna go ahead and end it so i don't take up too much more of your time uh got listeners if you are interested in um flexbone 101 make sure you check the description below i will have all of coach carrick's information there uh you can follow me on twitter i'll have all that stuff available for you as well uh this has been the armchair coaching podcast and this is coach sheffer signing out